is a lovely cycle, a circle of seasons as unending as its fruits are varied and profuse. What ultimate source is behind it, we do not have eyes to see. But wondrous it must be to proffer up the pulling moon and the warming sun, to array them there and send down water to quench the rock and make it rich for simpler things to show their souls, their fire and eyes. What monumental motion makes a flower, we would be gods to imitate. And what is true for them, works too in us. The bee is our brother, and we are all in concert. All springing buds and sunshine blooms and wintry gloom. We rest, but to begin again. In this series, we will trace the origin and spread of terrestrial life, hoping that this journey will heighten our appreciation of the place we have come to.
to have been Ishmael. To have gone down to the sea as a simple sailor is something that our middle age tells our lost youth it should have done. A universal lament of all landlocked men. Though inland far we be, our souls have sight of that immortal sea which brought us hither. One cannot come to water and not feel the urge to sail upon it, especially when it is the sea, and the gulls are gliding in full cry, and their waves are heaving in from a blue place out where we know we ought to be. What is it that draws us to the undrinkable sea? Some primordial instinct, some memory of a gill genesis that gives us kinship with the tides? Well, this is what our science tells us, as well as our souls. All earthly life, as we know it, evolved from that primeval and unfathomable source. And yet the ancient sea is only a child of more venerable verities. The sun and the earth and the moon rolled in the firmament for millions of years before conspiring to make the sea. The water wore down the mountains and carried the salt of the continents into the sea. And it was in this warm, briny bed that the first life was conceived, incredibly it seems to us, from non-living carbon compounds. Those first organisms fed on a soup of acids and carbohydrates until the sun shot through the thinning cloud cover to give them the energy to produce chlorophyll, that wondrous substance which allows plants to transform lifeless chemicals into protoplasm, the living stuff of their tissues. The seaweed, one of the earliest forms of marine plant life, has managed to live in the coastal shallows by developing strengthened stems and grasping root-like tentacles to resist the drag and pull of the tides.
cast adrift, they live, floating on tiny, balloon-like air sacs. Other organisms, lacking the magic of chlorophyll, found that they could subsist by devouring the plants. Thus came the animals. The poet Robinson Jeffers, that most prehistoric of seers, remembered the coming of animals and of men with a cosmic loathing. The cells of life, he wrote, of creation, bound themselves into clans, a multitude of cells to make one being, as the molecules before had made of many one cell. Meanwhile, they invented chlorophyll and ate sunlight, cradled in peace on the warm waves. But certain assassins among them discovered that it was easier to eat flesh than feed on lean air and sunlight. Thence the animals, greedy mouths and guts, life robbing life, grew from the plants. And as the ocean ebbed and flowed, many plants and animals were stranded in the great marshes along the shore, where many died and some lived. From these grew all land life, plants, beasts, and men, the mountain forest and the mind of Aeschylus, and the mouse and the wall. This seems to have been the way it was in that distant and dim beginning, from molecules to plants to fish and amphibians, to reptiles and mammals, until life on the land was almost as varied as life in the sea, and more complex with man. But sometimes we forget it in our walk upon the land. It is as if we have so forgotten our origins that we do not stop to hear the surf pounding in our hearts. We have been upright on these rocks, but a little, really, in the turning of geologic time and yet we strut about as though our legs and the land were everlasting. Man has but to look at the sea and listen to it to know that this is not so. Our time as terrestrials diminishes with the wash of every rain and the lap of every tide. Even to our short span of attention, it is evident that the sea is eating away at the table of land, as it does here on the coast of Maine turning great rocks to salt and sand. Even the rain clouds we welcome are conjured up by the sea. And while their water restores us, it also washes away the ground of our being. All the brown rivers run to the sea. Swinburne saw it in his time when he wrote, till the slow sea rise and the sheer cliff crumble, till terrace and meadow the deep gulfs drink. It is a mighty mother, our sea. Ceaseless, rising and falling over 71% of the Earth's surface, it continues to expand as the land shrinks. At last, Rachel Carson says, all life will return to the sea, to the giver and the taker of life.